And um, hi, everybody. Uh, this is a continuation meeting one week after. Um, I am going to just hand this over to um, Vitalik, uh, who is talking about the um, state expiry. Um, actually, going back to the original um, simple summary as well. So, um, uh, and then uh, afterwards, because um, I think this will not take the whole time since Vitalik got most of the way through the explanations before. Uh, afterwards, we wanted to have a bit of a discussion, uh, which is going to be led uh, or, you know, uh, a lot by Ansgar um, on um, some thoughts around, um, uh, you know, what would be the plan for doing the uh, testing and development um, and eventual deployment of some of this. And we may also do a little bit of meeting scheduling towards the end as well, um, because uh, this definitely deserves uh, a track. All right, Vitalik, handing it over to you. Thanks. Okay, sounds good. So in the last call, I think we covered verbal trees completely. Um, and we also uh, covered uh, state, some of the state expiry, uh, but not all of the state expiry. So I guess uh, just a quick recap of uh, where we are with the, the state expiry EIP. So the state expiry EIP assumes as prerequisites uh, the Virgil Tree EIP and it assumes an address extension. And so the state uh, when the state expiry fork happens is basically that we're in period one and there is a Patricia tree for period zero and there is a verbal tree for period one. The Patricia tree for period zero is static because the only tree that's uh, modifiable is always just the latest one. And the, per the state expiry fork begins period two, and it also schedules the beginning of the future periods, right? So we'll, we'll have uh, something like uh, one period per year from that point on. At the beginning of period two, um, this is in this is the transi <coughs> transition section. Uh, but we kind of surgically replace the Patricia tree with just the Virgil root, which uh, anyone can compute off chain after the beginning of period one. The Virgil root is just a root of a Virgil tree that stores equivalent uh, data to the Patricia tree, and that's just a thirty-two byte or forty-eight bytes or whatever hash, depending on how we do it. And that's something that uh, can just be um, sort of provided directly as uh, part of the EIP specification eventually. So there's no need for clients to compute it in real time, which is really nice. Um, so after, and then it also adds a, a period two state tree, Merkle tree, which is empty, right? So there's going to be a list of these Merkle trees and uh, only the last two are required to actually be stored by clients and everything before the last two clients only have the root and they uh, or and then users or any kind of operations that read the state that's um, older than the most recent two periods will just have to be proven by providing a verbal proof. So or one verbal proof per transaction is the way that it's uh, done in uh, this uh, in this design here. Uh, so uh, we talked about a, a bit about address periods. Um, they were called address spaces in the last EIP, but I think uh, Pavel complained uh, that the word address space means something different. So I hear renamed it to uh, address periods, which uh, seems totally reasonable. Um, but basically, every address has this uh, period number. Uh, and the idea is that an address with some period number cannot be modified until the epoch is equal to or greater than that period number, right? So an address with period number seven can only be modified starting epoch seven. The purpose behind this mechanism is basically um, that if you have a, uh, if you want to modify uh, or create new state objects as part of a, like, that are either storage slots of an existing contract or that are child contracts created by an existing contract or anything like that, then we want it to be possible to do that without having to, uh, or at least for some period of time, without having to provide new witnesses, right? Uh, so for example, let's say someone wants to create a new ERC-20 token and we want it uh, to be possible to like uh, have balances of that era, of that ERC twenty token and give people new balances without uh, requiring the uh, 
requiring them to provide witnesses for that. And so the way that you would do this is that if, let's say, we're currently in epoch five, then you would create a contract, and that contract has address space five. And so when you uh, create or try to access state objects that are in address space five, then it, we know that according to the protocol rules, it was not possible to modify them before. And so there's not no need to provide any witnesses that show like what the value of that particular location was previously. And so we just uh, can just directly kind of dump the number five into the state. Now, then obviously if you create this kind of contract, then you'll be able to fill new storage slots in um, address space five. You'll be able to fill new storage slots in address space uh, six, uh, but then starting from address space seven, filling new storage slots is going to require a witness, right? Because the witness has to prove that there was, that storage slot was not already filled with something else uh, in address space five. And that, and then from then on, like you will still be able to modify, uh, modify without witnesses storage slots that have, or contracts that have been modified uh, before more recently but like for new things you are going to need a witness because you're going to you're going to have to prove that like there wasn't something else already there that you wrote if you're trying to read it um so just as like one example might be interesting to go into the way that you would probably want to create an uh, erc20 contract in a state expiry model so that it works maximally well right so like existing erc20 contracts would continue to work they would just uh, get more annoying over time because you, you're going to have to start providing a, a providing witnesses for sending tokens to new accounts when those new um, if uh, those in right for sending tokens to new accounts um the way that you would do it in this model to try to avoid all of that pain is basically the erc20 contract would have a child contract and uh, there would be a child contract for each uh, address space so let's say the RC20 token got created in address space or in epoch or in epoch five, uh, you would have a child contract with uh, address period five, a child contract with address period six, a child contract with address period seven, and so forth. And the storage of the balance of an account that has address period n would be in the child contract with address period n, right? So like if, for example, this uh, ERC20 contract got created during um, let's say address period 50, then, or let's say, sorry, let's say it got created during address period five and you're currently in address period 50, then if you want to uh, just send someone uh, coins for an address where that new address was created during epoch 50 or during epoch 49, then that would just be stored in the child contract, which is in uh, either epoch 50 or 49. And so you don't have to provide a, you know, a, a witness to create it. But if you want to uh, send someone coins for the first time and their address was created, let's say 10 epochs ago, then, and the ERC20 contract was itself also created 10 epochs ago, then like that's something where you are going to uh, have to um, have to provide some witnesses and that's unavoidable. Now there, there may potentially be even better, uh, even better designs for something like this, um, but this is, uh, I guess something that's up to the uh, like this is basically kind of an open space and there's probably an opportunity to kind of develop and optimize around this sort of model right so the basically just some warning that there is there, there is going to be some required kind of di different design patterns in order to for contracts to systems to continue to work efficiently and not require any witness provision if the intent is for them to survive a really long period of time but it's also at least in my opinion much less bad than any of the previous state expiry proposals um right the, the previous state expiry proposals might have like required accounts to uh, to, to pay rents for their erc20 balances and required fair complicated internal economic logic and so forth here you don't need any of that i uh, hear the worst thing that happens, even if you have to do absolutely nothing, is that over time you're going to have to provide more and more witnesses. And even providing witnesses isn't uh, too bad because eventually we're going to have snarks and so eventually the gas cost for providing a witness for like even 100 years is going to be fairly small. Um, but 
if you want to like be optimal with your contracts, uh, then you know th there are going to be some different code patterns that are needed. So that's a bit of an aside, and it's a sort of one of the things that I think it would be interesting to start more properly look at, um, looking into fairly early. Um, so we have this new transaction type, right? And uh, the new transaction type, it uh, specifies the same things that a transaction type does today, except it has two things. It has a, a target address period. So that specifies the address period of the target. And it has a claimed states list, which is basically the same as an access list. It just says like what state the transaction is accessing and the state that it could be claiming it can claim a state from the current or previous address period, or it cannot claim state from the current or previous address period. So claiming state from the current or previous address period is this, uh, you know, fully voluntary activity that's just uh, like basically the same thing as uh, any IP2930 um, access list. But then if you access state that is in, that was um, most recently modified in address spaces that are at least two before the previous, um, right? So if you're accessing state that was not accessed recently, that was not accessed within the last one to two years, then you, you have to provide it as part of this uh, access list. And the claimed state structure is basically like this multi-level dictionary. It says here for every address and for every period that this um, um, that the state was last accessed, you have a list of these subtree claim objects and the subtree claim objects uh, kind of operate um, over subtrees. And then inside of them, um, you have some uh, further indices that you go down further and then you actually end up uh, providing the state. No, I think Vitalik lost audio. Yeah, Vitalik, we yeah, we lost you. If you can I don't think us. it's only I don't think it's only audio. His cursor is also not moving. Oh, and he's gone. Okay, we'll just give him a minute. He will undoubtedly try to come back. Maybe just in in the meantime, uh, what I just wanted to say briefly is that I feel like. The with the kind of terminology, it might make sense, at least in my understanding of the of the kind of the proposal to distinguish between like a period, which is the thing that just increments every single year. So like now we're in period five, and then next year or whatever the kind of the duration of a period is, we're in period six, and so on. And then the for the addresses, I feel like period might might be a little bit misleading because like if a contract was created in period five, then it has this prefix five, but then if we are in period fifteen, the contract still has this prefix five but it now is might also be copied over into the latest kind of state tree so maybe kind of basically like only call period the thing that's kind of like the the temporal has its temporal aspect and then use some other term to refer to the kind of this spatial aspect of it might, might make sense but i don't know What do you mean by spatial other than it's just the tash? No, I'm just, just saying that basically, um, uh, yeah, it, to, to me, it kind of makes most like, I think originally it was called kind of address space. And I understand that that's kind of like not an ideal term because it's kind of also has other meanings, but it was kind of, it, it was still more suitable in my, in my understanding, just because it, it kind of clearly referred to like the okay, like a sub location within with, within the, the the address space instead of instead of like a time period. Sorry about that. One more. Oh yeah, no worries, Vitalik. We'll wait for your computer to come back online. Yeah, I did also think that uh, yes, yeah, space address space is very overloaded, but um, um, but yeah, it's uh. Sorry, my computer just like went um Im just immediately went offline on me and but I'm uh or I'm back now. Is uh, can everyone hear? Me? Yeah, we can hear you well. Do you want me to you know uh 
display the screen or is your computer back? One, two, three. We hear you. I think we can hear him, but he cannot hear us. Yep, that appears to be the conclusion. <laughs> Thank okay, you. excellent. I'm gonna then uh, turn the screen share back on. Um, okay, there we go. So the, yeah, right. So we have this new transaction type that basically provides this access list and it also provides a state proof which is basically one big verbal proof object that just uh, proves the and uh, proves the entire access list. Um, so uh, we have the origin for the transaction type is computed very similarly to any other uh, any other ELA transaction. Um, over here we have this uh, in this, uh, so currently there's a specification that just says that when the state period goes up to two any transaction types introduced before the CIP become invalid. Like I, I know that was a bit controversial last time it was presented. It's definitely not a core part of the proposal. Like uh, if we want, we can keep the other transaction types valid and um, except we can just add some kind of uh, translation table to them. Um, but even if they're valid, they would only be valid if those transactions only touch state that was um, accessed within the last two address periods, right? So um, the, the way that this works basically, I think no matter how you do it, a transaction created today cannot be valid um, uh, starting from the uh, state expiry EIP because a transaction um, created today is just going to access period zero state. And when period two starts, anything that accesses period zero state will have to provide a witness, right? So there is definitely this uh, unavoidable um, aspect of uh, the, like, I don't think that there is a way around it. Like basically the only way around it is that, well, I guess the transaction, okay, no, I think I'm wrong about that. I think uh, like if you have a, a transaction and that it's like EIP 2930 style uh, and, and then you could potentially add like a bit of extra data outside of the signature or, or outside of the signs data. And then you would add a little bit more extra data outside of the, um, outside of, uh, what was it, the um, data, the, the data that's being signed the same way that the uh, state proof over here is outside the data that's being signed. And then that's something that um, third parties can just uh, do if they want. Um, so that's um, address period. Right, so that's what that transaction type does. Um, also have a create three opcode. That create three opcode adds addresses with uh, higher address periods. Um, I, by the way, I remember that there was some feedback here about like how to deal with backwards compatibility issues and like, should we introduce some of these ideas during period one so people can get started with them? And these are definitely things that I did not think too much about. And these are definitely things um, that are, I think a good idea to discuss. Um, so, right, we define state period, and then over here we have state tree mod. So state tree modification rules. Um, so I think I talked about the modification logic a bunch of times already, right? The modification logic basically says that anytime state gets edited, the edit always gets saved in the most recent state tree. And when state gets read, you basically need to first check the most, if it's in the most recent state tree, then check if it's in the second most recent state tree. And if it's not in one of those, then it's in an older state tree. And then like the idea is that you're supposed to kind of check if it's in the third most oldest, uh, uh, third most recent, then the fourth most recent, then the fifth most recent, but you don't check that directly. Instead, like basically in at least this function, uh, you're just checking if it's, if it's in the state claims and then separately, um, we add into, um, we also check in the state claim proof that like, let's say for example, you're currently in, in uh, epoch uh, or in period 10 and you access some state that was most recently accessed in period five, then you basically have to provide a proof that that state was the value you claimed in period five. And also that there was nothing there in period six and nothing there in period seven and nothing there in period eight, um, right? So this is, uh, the, so that's actually done over here, right? So this whole thing is like, is actually validating the state claims. Um, so validating the sub access list, which is uh, a fairly 
intricate procedure, um, but the way that it's basically done is that we first, um, so this just checks whether or not the list of state claims is well formed, like whether or not everything's unique. Um, like just making sure that it's unique, making sure that it's not self-contradictory, making sure that it's sorted and correctly formatted and all of those good things. Um, over here, what we basically do is we convert the state claims into a tree claim and or a vertical claim. And uh, a vertical claim basically says, here is the vertical root, here is the key, um, and uh, here, is, uh, here is the value. And the reason, like, so basically this just uh, a kind of takes the state claims and converts it into a list of those kinds of objects. And then I'm basically assuming that we have some separate ver verify more verbal multi-proof function, which takes a list of roots, keys, and values, and basically just um, verifies that you have a proof for that, right? So right now I'm saying this is TBD because this is actually something that's based already being worked on as part of the current verbal tree implementation. And so like that is just something that we're going to have, right? Because for the sake of uh, stateless clients. Um, and so when we have that, that's something that we'll also be able to just uh, directly repurpose as uh, part of the protocol rules, which is uh, really nice. Um, Intrinsic gas cost calculation. So this is just charging for um, uh, the witness gas. It's uh, basically just trying to uh, kind of keep up the, yeah, the the rule that you have to pay at least some amount of gas for every byte of data, including bytes of data in the witness. Um, charging uh, witness branch and uh, witness uh, chunk cost for not just uh, basically for every single one of the branches. So if you access something 20, uh, 20 address periods old, then you have to pay 20 times the branch cost and 20 times the chunk cost for now. Like in reality, 20 periods from now, we're definitely going to have ZK snarks. And so that like, uh, things are going to change again, but that's a kind of the access set. So basically this is just taking state claims as a uh, vertical uh, and, and treating it as an access list and actually populating the set, the access subtrees and access leaves leave objects and the access subtrees and the access leaves objects are basically the replacements to um, EIP 2929 access sets that, and they're very similar to EIP 2929 access sets um, that are just defined over here. They're defined according to this uh, kind of more principled uh, witness, I get where this gas cost calculation approach. Uh, so here's the the rationale section, but I think I, I basically talked about a lot of this, right? Um, only the most recent tree can be modified. Full nodes are expected to hold the most recent two trees. And so if you modify anything that's older, then like let's say you modify that, or if you read something that's older, then you have to provide a proof for this. You have to provide a proof that it was not here. You have to and then for these two, you don't have to provide a proof because uh, clients have the most recent two trees. Um, so that basically is the uh, state expiry proposal. Um, okay. Oh, by the way, I'm someone can, can just someone, anyone else uh, say something right now? Check, check. What was that? <laughs> yes, we heard you. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, no, no, no. I, uh, I just, I, uh, I hear you two manual sound thing that like sound source that overrides the, uh, yeah, a given down source and so I yeah, just uh, had to manually switch it to my AirPods, but yay. So I guess the uh, conversation is two way now. Um, so that's the state expiry EIP. I, and I'm definitely happy to kind of go into the question and discussion and like talk more deeply about things uh, part now. Great. Um... Yeah, it's really helpful to have, um, you know, to have gone through uh, and to see all of the thinking behind it. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, um, uh, I'll just open it up here if there's uh, anybody who had a, a question. I don't think anything came up in chat on the side here um, uh, this time, um, other than Onscar just, uh, making a comment about uh, temporal versus spatial. Um, I think, you know, the address period question, Vitalik, probably just comes from, I think there's a little bit of uh, uh, of overuse of the number that 
on the one hand, there's the idea that there's the epoch where you create something new, which is kind of like opening a new space. But then as you're referencing the object again and again, uh, then it operates in a different way because you're referencing an object that was created at some past, you know, address space three. Um, but then it can be referenced at seven, eight, nine, or whatever it is to the current date. Um, so it is a little bit of, a, uh, you know, um, could be a little confusing for the casual person to look at it that the, you know, the, the term of the uh, period or the epoch for the addresses gets used in these two different ways. Yeah, the, the, that's definitely something that requires a bit of head wrapping. Like there's the concept of the current period, then there is the concept of what address period an address has. And then there is the concept of which state tree um, an address has a saved record or a storage location has a saved record in most recently, right? And that's a different thing. Like if you have a, a 20 year old account, but it was accessed three months ago, you don't have to provide proof because it is in the most recent state tree. But if it was a 20 year old account that was accessed three years ago, then well, you might have to provide one or two witnesses because that might be like three uh, three periods ago, and you had uh, it's uh, the most recent saved record is in uh, is in the state the, the period and minus three state tree. Um, so. Yeah, you're right. I mean, definitely that that's a very nice, elegant feature in this proposal that you automatically have this kind of reduced cost. I mean, it's only a pay forward cost, so it's not a backwards kind of stake rent. But um, you do have this property that just uh, as uh, as data gets staler, um, the staler and staler gets the more expensive it is to resurrect it. Um, so you pay at the time you want to use it, which is really great. Um, I think uh, uh, I think one thing um, just is just sort of uh, I, I observed that it's not talked about in this way in the EIP and others, but I, I wonder if uh, it would be a helpful view for people to instead of viewing this as something for expiring state and other stuff, instead there's another way to view this whole um, EIP Vitalik for explaining to a newcomer that this is a, you know, uh, in protocol, um, you know, consensus agreeable version of a caching system um, because it's worked, you know, relatively hard to basically have a two, you know, a two period automatic, uh, you know, um, use of uh, any new addresses or the most recent reference. Like, let me just verify I have this understanding correct, Vitalik. If we're currently in address, uh, if we're currently in state uh, uh, in state epoch 11 and we read something that was originally created in uh, epoch 3, we'll provide the witness the first time, then when we write back to it, or even if we read it now, um, again, it will be appearing in the uh, tree for epoch 11. And now when we increment over to Epoch 12, yes. Epoch 11 is in cache, and so we don't have to provide witnesses at all for that data in Epoch 12. Correct. Yeah. I'm just so, avoiding the use of the word Epoch because Epoch is now a 384 second thing. But yeah, that is a Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm using the word Epoch incorrectly. You are right. Um, state expiry period is what you're calling it, right? So, um, so then if that, if that statement though, other than the use of the wrong word there, um, is correct, then yeah, it does really look a lot like a, you know, blockchain kind of verifiable, you know, I'm sorry, a blockchain agreed scheme for what is in the cache and what is not. Um, and from a performance perspective, that's one of the most important parts because it means that active state that's happening over that two window. Uh, two, two sliding window of periods will basically mean most data will not have to have witnesses added. It'll just continue to be um, modified. Exactly. So maybe with regards to kind of like how to how to structure like the, the remaining part of this this call, like one thing that I'd personally be interested in is, is just in, to like get a general feeling for if people think like, are people convinced that this is a generally good approach that, that we should take? Of course, I mean, with details yet to be worked out and everything, or, or is it, or are people, are there people that are still skeptical? Um, I, I saw that exit, uh, you were posting a little bit about the address space extension. I think that's probably the, the bottom where there's 
the most kind of details yet to be worked out. Um, but but like, is, is, is this generally like a way that people feel comfortable with? Because if so, then then I feel like we might already be in a position to kind of start talking about how to go from here, like how to start prototyping all of this. But of course, if people, if, if there are still people like they're skeptical, then now probably would be a good time to discuss that. My skepticism is, as it always has been, um, almost entirely around the address space extension stuff. I suspect it's because I just don't understand it, but that's where my personal fear lies. Like everything else, I think, will work perfectly if the address space extension works perfectly. Um, so, I mean, Mika, on that one, um, the address space extension, uh, it's not really highlighted in this track here because uh, it's uh, a part of, you know, um, just the, you know, sorry, in today's discussion, because it's part of uh, just uh, converting to um, having vertical trees for, um, you know, light clients in the future. Wait, hold on. Are we talking about address extension as in 20 to 32 bytes, or is it adding the concept of address periods? Uh, 20, to, 20 to 32 bytes is the bit I was talking about. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. That's, uh, you know, the, the, the 20 to 32 byte extension is, uh, it, it's definitely a challenging thing that, uh, it deserves a pretty significant amount of attention. One question in that context for, for, for my side would be, um, I, I've heard people say that basically just because of um, hash collision issues, um, we might have to, to, to move to a kind of extended outer space uh, relatively soon anyway. Is that basically definitely the case? And because if so, it feels like even even if there are issues, we we basically don't have a choice. So we might as well <laughs> use the opportunity and build stays very around it. Um, yeah. So, so so what's the situation there? Yeah. So so basically, what happens is um, that if we um, well, first, there's that EIP that we talked about at all core devs, I think, of like banning using contracts as EIPs, because uh, that's like a really serious um, attack vector, um, right? But then the other th the main thing that will break if we just never upgrade to 32 byte power will be able to um, create two contracts with the same code that have different functionality. And that will basically mean uh, breaking the um, or breaking the ability to have counterfactual contracts so breaking the ability to have like contracts on chain that have not been, that people interact with but that have not yet been published um so that includes um let's see like possibly it would make certain um use cases where you set up well it would make state channels uh, not real uh not reliable is uh, one example. Um, another, a somewhat um, more kind of esoteric but also serious example, which is a smart contract wallet developer uh, could make a smart contract wallet code where that smart contract wallet code also collides with uh, code that's controlled by smart contract uh, wallet developer. And so basically, like if you use their library, which looks like a totally legit uh, smart contract wallet creation library to create your wallet, and then you receive funds, but the ad that contract is not yet on chain because you have not yet sent a transaction. Um, then, like it's possible, the attacker could could just uh, like submit the contract first that has their version of the um, so, uh, the question. Is, what's the maximum like, value that we that we expect? Uh, in these kind, kind of, of the mo the example most serious victim would there would you know well actually as we want to move toward a smart contract so well it's uh, a lot. 
Don, correct, could you repeat your right, question? Right, like the use case of uh, having a wallet. Oh, the the question was just that, like, how much ETH is like is practically affected by the answer is like in the short term quite little, but in the long term a lot, uh, because in the long term, like, like, so, like, for example, let's say we want to get rid of EOA, EOAs and we want them, or at least to de-emphasize them and move to smart contract wallets. Well, you're going to have people who, like, whenever you have a smart contract wallet, you're going to receive funds before you send them, right? And in between receiving the funds and sending them, you'll, you're going to have your coins in a counterfactual address. And then potentially, you, if, if this counterfactual address is a cold wallet, then you know, you could end up having a significant amount of funds in it you know, for a fairly for a fairly significant period of time. Um, Wait, but then, in this case, like, you would have created the contract right now. They don't really do much, but mm -hmm. mm, no. Well, okay. So the case that I'm assuming, right? But the attack vector I'm considering is an attack vector where you create this the contract address using a software library that was developed by a malicious developer but which passed security audits because like the library actually is totally legit it's just that the attacker uh, kind of like twiddled a few innocuous knobs to create a yeah, smart contract code where that that is totally legit but that has a collision with another smart contract code that just sends all the money to the attacker Wait, so they pre-computed the smart contract so that the creates two addresses it creates would be collisions. That's what you mean, right? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, is it efficiently possible to do that for several addresses though? Or, or would that be really specific for just one address? Actually, That's, um, Oh, that's a good that, that that's a good question. I guess right now the init, the entire init code does get hashed into the address, right? And the init ends of the init code will what ends up containing your public key, right? Okay, so that's also not that serious. Um, hmm. Okay, so I guess uh, that's not that serious, but basically like being unable to update the security model. And it's this sort of thing that like could lead to just uh, people like just a much higher ba develop, uh, barrier to for developers because this is something that people have to worry about instead of just being able to like, um, assume that uh, code to address is a simple collision resistant mapping. Um, but uh, the, I think the state channel examples are definitely well, that's something that I think can uh, you can break multiple times. Well, I feel like if it that, could. Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, just in the state channel example, could you build a scheme where you say, let's have a new opcode, create three, it creates a new contract, but it would return a 32 byte value of the address. And then in the protocol, you just use the 20 bytes as normal. And you uh, you basically prove that, and, it, and I guess it would have to use the deploy, it would be, yeah, you'd have to use the deployer address so that you know it's gonna deploy that opcode. And so then you can convince these people you're gonna do this right. kind of factual agreement so, with well, that it's coming from that contract. Well, this idea that you create a 32 byte address and then in the parts of the system that are not um, upgraded, you just pretend it's a 20 byte address. Like that is the thrust of how this up this uh, proposed upgrade procedure works, right? Um, like if you include that and you also include the fact that these new style addresses are gonna have to hold ERC20 tokens when uh, a lot of the ERC20s are old style. So then maybe the kind of the primary branching point here seems to be around address extension. Um, at, at least that, that, that seems that that's basically how, how it feels feels like to me, where, where either uh, address extension turns out to, for some reason, be kind of um, just impossible or, or like infeasible with, with, with costs too high or something. And then 
we accept that some some limited use cases won't work in the future in Ethereum, and also um, static story won't work, and and go forward with that, or otherwise we go forward with address extension and um, build static story around that. Um, the question then to me becomes, I mean, for one, is that really a realistic option that we find uh, that address space extension might not be possible? And two, um, if it if it's a realistic option, then which like which parts of, of the of the work towards state expiry depend on that so so for example worker trees seem like we we would want to move to, to like to them anyway right regardless sorry so can, one, can i interrupt there like i yeah, i right. just don't think this what you're saying is realistic like we need address space at extension at some point the question is only a matter of time like we're talking about whether we need it in one year or in five years we will need it i think there's like uh, Everything else seems, any suggesting anything else seems crazy to me. Yeah, so, so yes, I agree. We need address space extension, but I think one in five years is a big difference. So if, I, if I agree, I address... agree. But it just sounded like it just sounded like we could like, oh no, we're not, we're never gonna do it. Like that, that's nah, not a realistic. Option. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's more for for me. It's more like if if address space extension is a five year problem, then state expiry. This particular incarnation of state expiry now becomes a five year problem unless we find some other solution. And we also need state expiry or something like it very soon because we have a state problem. And so I, I do think that answering the question of is address extension something we definitely can do soon, um, very important because that determines our timeline for state expiry. Okay, but then picking it back up there. Um, so while we just, while we try and determine that question, so so basically which parts of, 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 of this proposal would be independent of that? I assume basically the, the work on Burger trees, that that is independent of that, and uh, even in a scenario where address space extension only arrives in five years, we would basically finish the work on burger trees and then find some other way of migrate. I assume we could even more or less do the same thing. Basically, I have like a second tree, start copying things over at some point, basically basically expire that. I don't think that necessarily depends on on the address scheme. Um, it would just have to be like a one time. Um, well, I don't know. Yeah, I think. I think that's that's reasonable. I think we could probably do the Merkle tree transition um, just as described in the state expiry that Vitalik just went over. Um, even if we can't get address space extension in anytime soon, I think that's still valuable and it still gets to step one. Um, I mean, the other question is why state expiry is so critical when we have uh, when we have statelessness, right? I, I would say it becomes much less critical and maybe it can be uh, done on the same timeline as 32 byte addresses. Well, at if that, that point, is it only natural once we have statelessness, I think it's only relevant for bug proposers. Is that right? Right. Uh, bug proposers and, and state providers, I guess, which we will also need because end users will need some ways of actually computing the results of their transactions before they send them. Yeah, I think it Wait. depends on which version of statelessness we're talking about. Uh, maybe there's kind of we're coalescing on one. I'm just out of the loop. Yeah. So is, is this version of uh, statelessness as though is one where you don't you don't need a state to verify things, um, but you do need state to produce blocks. You do need state to uh, see the the result of transactions, and uh, like there's no notion of mandatory access lists. Yeah, so in that version of statelessness, I think that there's still a pretty, pretty big value in state expiry because we still do want those tasks to be as decentralized or uh, distributed as possible. So like as many people can do those things as possible. Which means uh, when, requiring seven, seven gigs. Why, of, why, why is it, why I, I, I kind of, I want to um, like, I'm not sure about that because like, the, the point of this version of statelessness is that if someone gives you these answers, it's really easy for you to verify them, right? Because like, you only need your state root to do that. Um, so in that, like, in that sense, like basically we have a way to make Infura much better than it is now. Right now, everyone has to just trust Infura. Instead, now you run your node, which is like really low, like really low effort. It costs, costs nothing. Uh, and you get Infura to like give you the state, and uh, but you don't have to trust them. And if Infura is down, there will be like two or three others that you can ask. So why does it have to uh, be yeah, super so I, I I'm not saying it should be n equals one, but I'm not. I'm questioning yeah. whether it needs to be n equals ten thousand. I think that um, 
that version of Tales of this is significantly better than what we're in now. I'm 100% on board with it. My concern is basically more around the censorship angle. If there's only three state providers in the world, and it's Infura and QuickNode and Alchemy or whatever, and they all happen to be headquartered out of the United States, and the United States decides to ban Ethereum or whatever new thing they're going to do, that gives a very easy attack vector. It just hit three state providers I, and right. all everything no, goes down. Kind of issue. No question about that. But now let's say n equals 100. Like, I mean, that, that I think is very easily possible. And even if the state is, say, becomes, let's be crazy, like one terabyte, right? That, that's a big step. Um, so even then, like building a kind of node that can hold that state um, will maybe now cost you a few thousand dollars. Like, so I, I don't see the big deal about that. I would say we can easily get hundreds of them if we do that. So I think, I think one of the reasons I um, would like something to solve that is because, well, yes, one terabyte is something that, you know, I could run or you could run probably. Um, it'd be nice if we can get to a point where, um, where anyone can, can run it. And the reason, hang on, sorry, I just lost my train of thought because I read what Piper said. So yeah, so if, if Piper's plan works out with the portal network, then I, I do think that our need for um, state X free goes down significantly. So I guess maybe that's the first question is, are we assuming the portal network hits off and works? Um, I think we still need state expiry simply because the uh, the cold state becomes a lot easier for the portal network to serve because it gets all frozen and stuff. And there's properties that come out of that that are nice where all of the, the old, old, old stuff gets easier and easier to serve because you get to bundle it up together. It doesn't change anymore. Um, but more in just a general sense, one of the main pieces that portal network aim aims to provide is on-demand access to arbitrary state. Yeah, and I think that one of the nice things about if we can get state expiry and, and portal network, ideally both, um, up and running is that we can increase the rate of state additions. So right now we're kind of constrained because we have to keep things forever. If we want to keep things for two years, you know, we can increase block size much more freely because that's no longer a big bottleneck. Um, like it's, we, it's no longer a trade we're having to make. Like by Like right now, every state that is stored is stored forever on any full node or every you know, full state node. And it'd be nice if we can get away from that. And we now say, okay, we only have stored it for two years. And so that gives us more breathing room. So you know, that one terabyte now um, can be one terabyte of two years of state instead of one terabyte of all of history. Look, I'm completely fine with state expiry. I, I just wanted to throw in that my opinion at least is that a five year timeline on that is actually acceptable to me. I feel like yeah, I mean, state's going to grow quite a bit, probably. Um, but even if, if it becomes one terabyte in that time, it's not going to break Ethereum. It's not going to break decentralization. So I think that's pretty good already. So, Don Craig, when you say that, is there an assumption that it's going to be kind of OK for you know everybody who is staking um, and you know, proposing blocks to have some offloaded service or, you know, is there still a goal to have fairly decentralized, you know, light block? Yes. Yeah. So, yes, I, yes, this, this would assume that um, small stakers do not build their own blocks, um, which I think is very likely given what we see with MEV anyway like that you more or less will end up uh, just getting them ready packaged and people like just, um, yeah, bidding to get their nice MEV extracting blocks in. Um, Plus with SSV, I mean, you know, yeah. and with the cost, with the price of ETH at, uh, you know, 60,000 US dollar um, per validator, it does seem like it's less likely for many people to, you know, be able to put together uh, uh, a validator node themselves. Yeah, I think I agree with Dan Grant. I wanted to just check though. So is Portal a dependency before Epoch 2 is launched? No, Portal, Portal should never really be a, a, a consensus protocol dependency. Um, well, I guess that's I guess that's not what you're asking, though. Or, um, or maybe the general one is yeah, before Epoch two, that there are you know uh, robust state provider. 
No. Uh, pr I don't think that we can answer that question from here. It's kind of just like too far away and too unclear exactly how all of that plays out. Um, I think that there is, you know, right now the default assumption of clients is that they keep all of the state. And at that point, if we're yep. getting towards Agreed. Epic two, Epic two, and we're about to, you know, expire the first Epic, then, and we don't have a solution on hand for how people get that old state, then chances are clients just keep the state for a bit longer. But, but, but that probably means that we didn't plan ahead very well if we get to that point. So I think it's, it's, you know, maybe an assumption that we can make that, that, that will be something that we will know is coming for a while and secondary solutions are going to be something that we we are going to know that we need to focus effort on. So whether or not that's portal network or whether or not that's some other solution that gives us how how do we access that old state, we'll, we'll know it's coming. So it shouldn't be anything that surprises us. So then um, basically bring it back to, back to actionable uh, items here. But it, it, would it be fair to, to kind of say that the best way forward for now would be to to try and kind of keep the worker tree developments uh, agnostic on whether or not we will have um, state exploit um, soon after. Basically, have a, have a version that that is would only be used for for a general move from worker tree to worker tree, and one that that would immediately kind of comp compatible with with state exploit. And then in the meantime, try and basically figure out. How what's the timeline for address space extension? How how realistic is that on on, on a soon timeline? On, on, um, and so so that it, it basically if we if we are confident that we can do address space extension soon by the time the worker worker trees will go live, then we can immediately kind of have that be included in some some sort of initial state expiry step. And otherwise, we basically just don't do that initially. Is, is that is that like a fair summary of where we are then? Wait, wait uh, sorry, just a question. If you don't have uh, state expiry, how can you have vertical trees? Like my understanding is that you need to start from a fresh tree to introduce vertical trees. Uh, uh, I, don't well, think I, think, a, I don't think there's uh, an, any other route to, to that point without state expiry, is there? Couldn't, like, I, I, I think the kind of the problem of, of a transition is, is um, well, it basically was solved really elegantly with, with the state expiry approach. But of course, if we don't have that, then we have a problem of how do we like transition to the to the tree to the vertical tree um again but i don't think it's an unsolvable problem um unless think, someone yeah i think Wait, the I general mean, the current worker, worker tree eip um, does that right i mean yeah i mean i guess you could call it state expiry but it just has two state trees essentially so um what's the exact problem with that well, but so basically what you would propose then is just to freeze the Merkle tree, keep it in place forever and use the ver a Merkle tree for new state or, or what's your what's your proposal then? Yeah, we would just we just move to period one and stop basically. So as, as a period one, we still retain well, period zero. You don't have to, but that doesn't mean that the Merkle tree stays around forever. You can also just um, have the Merkle tree for like a few months and then do a hard fork for you yeah. simply like everyone has offline converted the worker tree to worker tree and you replace it in place. Right. And then you have everything. Yeah, the, the, cha challenge is, uh, just, the challenge is just that like doing that is a little bit harder because cl like clients would actually have to have the new vertical tree with all of its uh, structure and, uh, and not just the root. Um, so like there are definitely right. savings from doing a switch over at the same time, um, but uh, yeah, it could be that. The, and then the other approach. Right. Yeah, and then the other approach that I think I recommended in the virtual tree EIP is that basically we can just uh, like do like potentially this could have been done through some automated EIP. You just like poke all the state and move it over into uh, period one, and at that point we could just forget the period zero tree because nothing's lost in it. Yeah, I think that kind of makes sense because my that, that would be my, my second question. Because if we would have to have two trees forever, then that seems to me at least to introduce some inefficiencies because you have to always have a second lookup if you if you have like a miss on the on the vertical lookup. Um, right. The idea is not to have it forever, but to have state expiry introduced, but maybe like not on a necessarily one year timeline, but on a two to five year timeline or something like that. Sure, but we'd still like double the read overhead for five for, for several years. That that seems 
not not ideal to me. I think we can pretty easily yeah. move to all verticals. I think that's uh, we can use the same strategy, just with a couple caveats. But I don't think it would like if we do all the work to get vertical trees implemented, for example, on every client. I do not think that will go to waste. Like that, even if we don't get state expert for five years, I still think that's good effort that we can leverage sooner. Right. So then, kind of. That, that that leaves us with basically continue the work on the, the work on vertical trees, kind of more or less independent, and uh, in, in parallel try and figure out what the kind of how realistic address space extension soon is, and, and basically what the timeline is, and and how to how to best get there. Is that? And that's what I feel. Um, really quick, just because we're I think this meeting's almost out of time. I was wondering, Axic, if you have a mic, do you think you could give us a rough uh, just? Temperature check, since I think you've spent the most time looking at the address space extension. How do you feel about it? Like, are you like, oh, this is confident. I just need to convince you all. Or is this like, eh, we think we can figure it out, but not yet. I actually may not have a mic. Yeah, I do have a mic. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I would say, um, yeah, we are not like a hundred percent confident that the, the translation map idea um, is is good enough um, because there, it may not be like protocol level issues, but a lot of like coordination issues. Um, there's a lot of um, potential cases where there is, um, where you could have loss of funds, so it would um, if you could get, um, a lot of this could be solved by just really getting all the, the wallet providers and a lot of dApps updated to avoid any, any kind of such situations, but that seems to be a lot of effort, um, you know, to be done outside of the, the core protocol. Um, and for some of these issues, it would be possible to put in safeguards into the core protocol, but that seems to be a really bad approach because it tries to, to mitigate issues, which don't really belong into the core protocol. Um, I mentioned in the chat that we are working on a, a new document. We, we wanted to share it uh, before this meeting, but um, we, we couldn't, um, but we do hope to share it in the next few days. And in that document, we um, it is not a specification. It is rather just exploring these uh, different properties and issues um, we have identified. Um, and it would be nice to uh, potentially go through those properties and issues and, and just get a feeling which which of those, you know, we as a group think are actually um, major issues and then, then we, we can look at, you know, how to solve them. Um, we do have um, an alternative proposal to the translation table, well, to the in-state translation table. Um, and that alternative is, is making use of access lists. Um, but it is only at the idea level, it's not like fully developed. Um, but if you want this very simple answer, how confident do we feel that this in the current version uh, with the current like translation map design? Uh, I don't think we feel, confident, we, we feel confident that this could be deployed, you know, in like a, in a one to three month timeline. I, uh, I think it, it definitely is more in the range of like six to nine months. Um, you know, earliest that this could could um, could be finalized and, you, and go out. Do you feel like the problems are generally solvable? We just need more time and research, or do you do you get the feeling there might be some uh, sleeping dragons that are unsolvable? I'm 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 hopeful that they can they can be solved. Um, maybe the, with these alternative approaches, um, but otherwise it it. Um, it definitely puts like a, a giant usability issue into the system. Um, um, I mean, technically it works, but, but you really expose a lot of um, these wallets and dApps to potentially mess up. Um, and I think we, we haven't really had issues to this extent. I mean, exposing, uh, you know, external software to, uh, so easily mess up. Um, so that would be a new thing we, we never done before. Um, but if you if think that that is, um, we don't really care about that, then 
then then even the current proposal seems to be pretty good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, given um, the time frame, uh, Axic, do you think uh, if you guys do get that out in the next couple of days, it, it seems like that is a address uh, extension is a pretty essential part uh, for this discussion. Do you think you would uh, hold a call somewhere else uh, and have that discussion or um, just do it internally among a smaller group? Um, I mean, whichever is, is, is better. Um, I think we could definitely um, go through the, the document and, and go through the, the issues one by one and um, either just, I mean, probably just reading it out uh, loud is, is not really useful, but having more of a um, brainstorming um, may be better, but probably one hour wouldn't be enough to go through all of that. Um, mm -hmm because we have um, how many, like 11 points. Hmm. Um, so would it, would it make sense to basically form a address space extension working group then? Like uh, would be, that, would, that would basically spend a, a more time um, to, to trying to figure this out? Yeah, I guess we could, we could have, um, a smaller call in similar to like those breakout rooms we had uh, for the all core devs. Um, maybe that would be the, the best next step. Uh, only have those people who are really interested in the in this topic and and go through this document um, in a more like relaxed manner. Um, and maybe afterwards, um, if if maybe the document would be a bit more condensed and and uh, more suitable for this larger call. Um, I'm not sure which which one is better. Um, it, it definitely is is more of a brainstorming topic as opposed to uh, Vitalik's run through today and then last time. Yeah, definitely the group of people would be people enough to um, really sort of read, study, and think about um, what you guys have analyzed uh, so they can contribute pretty actively to brainstorming. So um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think that would be pretty, pretty, pretty helpful. Um, seems like uh, that's quite important for this uh, for this topic as well. So, <clears throat> um, okay. Well, we're also uh, about ten minutes or almost ten minutes uh, over the hour. Uh, I just want to be mindful. Uh, thank you, people, for everybody for staying on uh, past that. Um, I think we definitely, Vitalik, thank you very much. You accomplished uh, getting everybody, you know, through a, a one-time kind of read-through and a little bit of discussion. Um, Ansgar, yeah, let me hand it over to you. Um, there's a little bit of time. I had a think about. Quick, quick question first, um, just to clarify okay. understanding here. Is is there a way to, um, that the vertical tree can just completely um, replace the, the Merkle tree in the current roadmap that Vitalik wrote here, or or does um? Do you mean for do you mean for state, or do you mean like also for history and beacon chain stuff? For for state, right? Um, it's like so, I'm wondering if the period too hard fork, mm -hmm. right? If it's possible to mm -hmm. do that. Do that. Well, this is the thing. This is the thing that we kind of briefly talked about. I think a, a, a bit before, right? Like you can either you can make a you can make a separate hard fork that replaces that uh, Virgil that Merkle tree with a Virgil tree, yep. or um, you can make a hard fork that basically pokes all of the period zero state and uh, brings it into period one. Um, and at that point, like we could just forget about the period zero tree. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so then um, my, my last question also <laughs> um, uh, to, to Vitalik um, was that basically, um, if it turns out that Edustate Space Connections needs more time, say three to five years or something, um, is there any, do you personally think that, that there's room for, for a state expiry scheme without address Space Extension? Of course, there are issues around kind of like, how can you ever, um, mm. Yeah, I mean, right, right, or is it then basically just not worth trying, and and, and we should 
uh, fully focus on I, uh, again, I think there's uh, there's two ways. So two ideas for that. One idea is to basically like just do the state expiry, but then give up on address periods greater than zero. And then and all that happens is that like filling new storage slots is just going to require more and more witnesses over time. And we just like accept that until we just expire state in five years. Another somewhat more sophisticated idea is that we could make an EIP fairly soon that bans a particular region of the existing address space. So like, for example, ban any address that starts with a particular four byte tag. And then we just use that address uh, space. So which would have 128 byte addresses or sorry, 128 bit addresses, which uh, totally fail on collision resistance, but still have free image resistance. And we just use that remaining space to like store periods um, that are greater than zero. And eventually we could have like from there, we could upgrade to 256 bit addresses. I see. So basically that would still be, it, it would still at least make sense to try and um, kind of um, see if we could, if we could do set expiry uh, independently and maybe, maybe still soonish in that case. Okay. Can you actually right. ban a natural space without uh, breaking anything? Like, that yeah, would mean some it. contracts, uh, some EOAs can't skip their contracts anymore, for example, stuff like that. Yeah, I think there's there's a, some usability problems that will arise and some integration issues. I mean, it, it's not my favorite <laughs> plan, certainly. Well, I mean, it's only a first pass idea, right? So I assume that there might be room to make it more user friendly in, in a more kind of worked out proposal. But, but yeah. And I mean, I, hopefully, uh, depending on course how the state, um, like the, the address space attention to the conversation goes, um, we might at least be at a point, point where we can kind of estimate how, how long it'll take to, 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 to fully do that um, within a couple, um, like relatively soon, right? And uh, a couple of months uh, in most. I, I think that that's not unrealistic. And so at, at that point, basically, it's, it, it'll be clear what, what kind of what options are, are, remain. OK, uh, I think we should probably um, uh, wrap up the call here. Um, I think there's a couple of uh, kind of discussions that'll happen around uh, what's the sort of planning um, for, you know, how we'll forward on with this. I think we'll look to AXIC for you on, um, you know, how you get more information out about your thoughtful analysis that you've been doing. And um, then I think we can do a follow-up to this discussion. Uh, I know Ansgar, we had talked about doing some more planning about, um, you know, the next uh, call and, you know, what's the right, um, uh, you know, um, if there would be a development process, it looks like it's a little bit early to have uh, that discussion yet until there's um, a little more clarity on the uh, address extension issue. Right. I, I think basically I, I was initially going to maybe propose um, to, to have like a se separate set expiry call and, and was maybe trying to do something similar to, 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 to what Mikhail has been doing for the merge calls. But I think as, as you were saying that that's maybe a little bit premature now. So I assume kind of like a some short term working group um, approach for, for the for the state uh, address space extension um, um, in, in combination with the, just the continuation of this call for now seems seems like the best best way forward. And um, of course, I mean, all, all these kind of small details of like who kind of organizes the calls and so on. I think we can figure that out offline. But um, but I think just in general terms, um, continuing those th these kind of calls for, for now until we have a clearer picture seems like a good idea um, on this. People have other opinions. Yeah, I, I think so. That makes sense. And I think uh, Don Prod made the comment about yeah, with uh, you know, with uh, uh, something you know, we already uh, 
we already with um, um, you know uh, Verkle witnesses being stateless Verkle witnesses being provided with blocks, uh, we then have the ability to not have to trust Infura. And um, so maybe, I don't know, um, if you were at the point, I know it wasn't that case about a month ago, but, uh, uh, and I think Piper dropped off already, but I think I'll, I'll oh no, Piper's still here. Uh, but I think having uh, an update and looking at that side would be also um, helpful uh, for the next call, Piper. Specifically, you know, portal network, of course. Uh, I sorry, I'm scrambling, getting kids ready for school, and only half listening. Uh, oh, sure. But I can, but but I can definitely give people an update on kind of what's coming with portal network and what to expect. And you know, that there's a lot of probability in that, but um, I think that there is a piece of that that is going to be sort of non-consensus critical but infrastructure critical protocol where that may go and it's probably worth giving people a picture of what that may may look look like as it plays out yeah yeah no because i've definitely with portal network um plus uh having you know light clients uh be fully sure about um you know the 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 state and the blocks that are coming back to them that would be that's already an important aspect so okay good well let's end it on that um unless anybody has any other business they wanted to um raise well just question question on, on that specifically um what, what's the status of kind of witness um formats I, I saw that vitalik already had like specification there as well but like is that also an area that still needs work basically like how would how could witnesses uh, look like with uh, with worker trees um or is that basically already more or less done or are there people actively working on it what's the what's the status there is an implementation of virtual trees which includes a yes an implementation of proofs but i don't think there is a set serialization scheme for proofs yet um, i think the extent of like formal nailed down serialization of the virtual tree is that the virtual tree eip can include um includes a uh, a precise spec for at least the virtual tree itself uh, but I don't, I, I don't see any fundamental obstacles to uh, making a, yeah, a precise proof format. And I imagine that will just emerge over the next month. Okay, sounds good. Then that doesn't need any specific focused attention, sounds like. Awesome. And that's all from my side. Okay. Uh, thank you all. And um, uh, I'll send a pointer when, or maybe Pooja will send as well, but we'll point everybody. Um, she's put together a, uh, 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 you know, indexed uh, publicly accessible view of the last set of meetings, as well as this one will go there as well. I'll send the recording out to this group though. So you'll get it sooner, but then um, uh, uh, there'll be a reference place where you can point other people to if they want to catch up, especially on these most recent, very two helpful, uh, uh, you know, presentations by Vitalik. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your uh, day or evening. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Thanks bye. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. -bye.